in a couple weeks here on Sunday, July 31st, I think that's that Sunday, we're going to have an opportunity to actually reflect on our trip, and we're going to have a couple students and a couple leaders actually come up here and share about what that trip meant for them and what it did in their lives and just an opportunity to kind of recap together and so that we're all celebrating the work that the Lord did in Orlando, Florida at the Life Conference. So we just wanted to give you a preliminary thank you for that. But we've got a couple announcements this morning before we transition into our time of praise and worship. And the first of which is this. We are excited to begin promoting our women's retreat that will be taking place this fall from September 9th through the 11th at Camp Forest Springs, September 9th through the 11th. Uh, the earlier bird deadline for that is Monday, July 25th. And you can get more information and register for that event at mahurch.net slash women's ministry or at the Connection Hub. We'll be having another church picnic on Sunday, July 31st. Love church picnics around here. They're a lot of fun. And that'll be after the service on July 31st. We'll need some help prepping and serving and setting up and tearing down for that picnic. So if you're interested in, in helping out with any of those means, you can sign up at the Connection Hub if you would like to help. And as always, you can grab a bulletin and a Connect card out in the lobby there if you'd like to connect with us or put down any prayer requests or stay in the loop on all the latest happenings here at Menominee Lions Church, you can do so in that way. And you can also click on the QR code on your screen if you are watching online, and that'll take you right to the bulletin as well. That's it for announcements this morning. I would like to pray for us now before we transition. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you that we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us therefore offer acceptable worship to you this morning with reverence and with awe. We pray these things in your name, King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we lift our voices and give the Lord the glory that's due his name this morning. He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold him He who heard humanity's cry Left his throne to wake as a child he became like the least of us. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring liar. Oh, be still and behold him.
saying I'm going to read Titus 3, 3 through 7. It's good for us to remember the holiness of God, his greatness, who he is, and to remember who we once were before we came to Christ. And Titus chapter 3 talks about this. It says, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Just remember, that's who we were. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, 
he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Praise God. Let's lift up our voices to him, this Father of kindness, the grace that he has poured out on us through Christ, and rejoicing in the truth that all of his promises in Christ are yes and amen. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can tell but see. Faithful you are. Promises are yes, amen. And all your promises are yes, amen. Beautiful Savior, you have brought me near. You pulled me from the ashes. Have broken every curse, blessed Redeemer. You have set this captive free. Lord, I can help but sing. Faithful, you are. Promises are yes, amen. And all your promises are yes, amen. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Yes, I will rest in your promises. My confidence. Is your faithfulness I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Is your faithfulness I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Is your faithfulness. Promises are yes and amen. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. And all your promises are yes and amen. And all your promises are yes and amen. This isn't on the screen, but we're going to sing the chorus of Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by All I have need, I have 
Praise you for the truth, Lord, that you cannot deny yourself. And so our, with our place uh, being in Christ and having our hope in him, just praise you that that's the place where all your promises are yes and amen, through Christ. And I confess that in this moment, and yet I confess, Lord, I don't even understand the depth of what that means. But help us to get closer to it even this morning. As we come to you, we've lifted up your, yes, your name and song. Lord, may we continue to lift you up as we hear your word being preached sure. in this moment. And would you be changing us again by the Spirit? Lord, change us, make us the people you desire us to be this morning. Right. You are worthy, you are holy. And we come to you through Christ. Lord, be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. All right. Test one, two. Testing one, two. Am I good? All right. Test one, two. There we go. Well, good morning, everyone. A resting place. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 132 today. Um, it's a wonderful psalm, a little bit of history, a little bit of poetry, uh, renewal of promises and vows that were kept and fulfilled. And as we look at Psalm 132, <clears throat> there's actually four sections to it. But the title that I want to give you today is A Resting Place. David made a vow that he would build a temple for the Ark of the uh, God of Israel. He didn't believe it was right that the Ark would abide in a tabernacle made with curtains and drapes while he lived in a house of cedar in a palace. And so he made a vow to prepare a resting place for the God of Israel. Psalm 132 has four sections to it. I think we have a slide that shows those four. David's vow is the first section or the first part. Solomon's fulfillment of that vow and then God's promise to David, which was made around the same time as the temple was dedicated, or just before. Yeah, actually it was quite a while before, sorry. And then as the temple was dedicated and the Lord filled it with his glory and power and presence, he made a promise to Solomon. And this Psalm 132 kind of touches on all of those things. There's a lot of history here, and there's no way we could cover it in a single 30-minute message. So I'll be reading sections of Psalm 132, and then uh, we'll talk about those in a little bit of historical context from uh, the Bible. But together, let's read in um, Psalm 132, beginning at verse 1, and we'll go uh, through a few verses here. As it begins, <clears throat> at verse 1. <clears throat> Remember, O Lord, on David's behalf, all his affliction, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the Holy One of Israel, Surely I will not enter my house, nor lie on my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord a dwelling place for the mighty one of Israel. Father, as we're here today, we ask for you to help us understand the meaning of this psalm over, this, <clears throat> over the centuries and what it means for us today. Guide us into your word. Help us understand your heart. Help us to understand our own hearts. And Lord, as we look at the heart of Solomon and the heart of David, help us to realize that these were men that knew you deeply and intimately. Doesn't mean they were perfect, 
but there were times in their lives when you had their heart completely. David was called a man after God's own heart. Solomon in his youth was a man dedicated to you, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Help us to learn from these examples. In Jesus we pray, amen. So David saw that the Ark of the Covenant was in a tabernacle, tabernacle of curtains. And that was by design because the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, they moved around a lot. They couldn't build a temple in one place. They were constantly moving from place to place for that 40-year period. But there came a time when Jerusalem was established as Uh, the primary city where the temple would be built. And David said to the prophet Nathan, prophet Nathan, this is in 2 Samuel chapter 7. David said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God rests within tent curtains. And David was determined to build a house for the God of Israel who was so far greater than he himself as king, he was almost ashamed that he lived in a palace of cedar and the Ark of the Covenant was kept in a tabernacle of curtains and drapes. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, I want to read a couple more verses there. Beginning at verse 12. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. God was very pleased with David for his desire to build a temple. But he told David, I've never requested anyone before, before you to build me a temple. And he didn't seem to express that it was urgent, but it was a desire of David's heart to do so. And he said to David, it is good that it is in your heart. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. The Lord says to David, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed as king before you. And your house and your kingdom, David, shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan the prophet told David. And this is the promise. We see that the vow is that God deserves a temple, and David swore he would make a temple for the God of Israel. The promise that God made to David was that he would be king and that his descendants and his throne would abide forever. And we know that Jesus was called the son of David at many times as we read through the New Testament. Son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were sick and lame, they would cry out to Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on me. What is the significance of that? It's the fulfillment of of this promise that God made to David, that David's descendant would have the throne forever, and that's Jesus. The son of David is a messianic term that they applied to Jesus when he walked this earth. And Jesus himself is the fulfillment of this promise, not only Solomon and David's descendants after, but Jesus himself would occupy the throne of David as Messiah forever. But there's something interesting in First Chronicles as we look at First Chronicles because the Lord told David, no, no, I don't want you 
to build me a temple. You are not the one. And that might have taken him back a few steps. But as we look at 1 Chronicles 28, God said to David here in 1 Chronicles, you shall not build a house for my name because you are a man of war and you have shed blood. A few verses later, he says to David, Solomon is the one who will build my house. I want to try and explain that a little bit. Why? Was it because David had sinned by being a man of war? No. No, not at all. Nothing like that. Did that make David somehow inferior because he had shed blood as a man of war? No, no, not at all. But Solomon was a man of peace. And this temple was absolutely magnificent. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And all the heads of every nation would hear of this temple. And they would be amazed by this temple and by the God of Israel. And the Lord did not want to be remembered as a God of war. He wanted to be remembered as a God of peace. So he didn't want a king who was a warrior for God to build it. He wanted Solomon to build it, who would be a man of peace and wisdom and justice. This is how God wanted to be remembered in the eyes of the world. And so his temple was to be built by a man of peace, not a man of war. Lest other kings come and say, yes, I want to know this God of Israel. He's a God of war. He defeats every opposition that comes before him. It's not how the Lord wanted people to remember him. And they didn't want, he didn't want people to come to him and serve him based on their ability to gain in a state of war. Because God is not interested in such things. He wants the heart. And as we look at David, God had David's heart. And David was content with the God, with what God had said. He said, okay, I understand. Solomon will build the temple. It will be done. I'll see it through. Whether or not I'm the one that builds it or not, I will see it through. And David put aside 300 talents of gold. I believe this was from his own personal wealth, possibly um, the nation's wealth. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. The Bible is not too clear on that. But David provided 3,000 3, talents of gold, 7,000 talents of silver to his son Solomon. He gave him for that purpose to build the temple of God. Now, a talent is not a unit of money. It's a unit of weight. The average talent, they do vary, but between 75 and 100 pounds is common. There's a heavier talent that's about 120, but it all depends on the nation and the king at the time. These things were flexible in many ways. But let's say the talents that David provided were in the, in the range of 80 pounds. Let's and take an average figure. 3,000 talents of gold would be $6 billion in today's money, along with 7,000 talents of silver. That's a tremendous amount of weight in precious metals. And then the people of David and Solomon also provided more. They provided 5,000 talents of gold in addition to what David had provided. 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of brass, and 100,000 talents of iron, along with precious stones and jewels and all of these incredible things. 5,000 talents of gold is $10 billion in today's money. So with the 3,000 David gave and the 5,000 that the people gave, that's $10 billion worth of gold in a single structure. Imagine that. Incredible to think about. And when I was reading as a young Christian in the books of Exodus and Leviticus, there was a tremendous amount of emphasis placed on gold, and, and, I, and I was puzzled by that. I, I said, Lord, in, in, in Exodus 37, when the, 
when the Ark of the Covenant is being put together, it's all overlaid with gold and it's everything in the, ta in the tabernacle is made of gold. And, and here again, David gives this incredible amount of, of wealth in gold and silver. And I said, Lord, why is it that, that there's so much emphasis in the, in, in the, in the Bible about gold? Why, why, is that, why is that so important? And, and I think the Lord was trying to help me understand <clears throat> it's not because the gold was important to God. It's because the gold was important to man. And God understands that when we give him what is most valuable to us, that he has our heart, at least to a degree. God's not concerned about gold and silver, but he is concerned about our heart. That's what he wants more than anything. And when we give what's most precious to us, it means that he has our heart, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe not in every case, but that's the goal, I think. So moving forward from here, we see that Second Chronicles chapter 6 is essentially, is essentially where Psalm 132 is born. Second Chronicles chapter 6. Solomon is dedicating the temple. It's now complete. It's an incredible picture of a man in his humility. Second Chronicles 6 tells us of a young king, probably somewhat intimidated. Now, he's been a king for a while, but the temple is built. It's complete now. Billions upon billions of dollars poured into this structure and uh, magnificent arch architecture, cedar from uh, Hiram, king of Tyre, I believe it was. Magnificent structure. Solomon has been a king for a number of years now, and he's dedicating this temple. But his heart is, is such that he's not proud. At least we don't see that. Any man in his position that had built something like this, king of Israel, with the most beautiful, endowed with wisdom beyond any other human being, it would be very easy for Solomon to be proud. But you know what he did? I want to show you. He set up a platform, much like this one, where all the people were out here at the dedication of the temple. The temple, perhaps, was standing behind him. And he got down in this posture, just like this, and he began to pray. And he began to pray to God that God would bless the temple he had built. And this picture of humility revealed quite clearly that God had Solomon's heart. I want to share a couple of things here from that chapter. Second Chronicles 6. Oh. A young king. Verse 12, 2 Chronicles 6. Then he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands. Now Solomon had made a bronze platform, five cubits long, five cubits wide, three cubits high, and had set it in front of the midst of the court, and he stood on it, and he knelt on his knees in the presence of all the assembly of Israel. And he spread out his hands toward heaven. And he said, O Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing kindness to thy servants who walk before thee with all their heart. Who has kept thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him indeed. Thou hast spoken with thy mouth and hast fulfilled it with thy hand as it is this day. Now therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him, saying, 
You shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your sons take heed to their way to walk in my law as you have walked before me. Now therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, let thy word be confirmed, which thou hast spoken to thy servant David. And Solomon is praying this prayer on his knees with his hands stretched out to God. That posture tells you a lot about his heart. You have to understand, this was a man that was wiser than any other. By the divine appointment of God himself, he was rich beyond imagination. And he was the king of the nation. How would you feel, people, if the president of our country did what Solomon did? Imagine a national leader or the governor of a state on his knees with his hands stretched out leading the people while he's on television in a prayer asking God to bless his people to take care of the nation. Oh Lord, may it be one day that humility is incredible. If you jump to the next chapter, God makes a promise to Solomon. It's in chapter 7, verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, and if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence, among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves, as you have done. I added that, sorry. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes shall be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place, in this temple that Solomon had built. From now for now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. The promise that God made to Solomon. So we see the, the vow that David made to God to build a temple. The fulfillment of that vow with Solomon's completion of the temple. We see that Psalm 132 reminds us of the promise that God made to David that he would have an everlasting kingdom and his throne would endure forever. And God promised that he would abide in the temple that Solomon had built, that Mount Zion would be uh, where his eyes were kept and he would abide. Now, let me move, move on from here and I'm going to have to move more quickly. Psalm 132, verse 8. Arise, O Lord, to thy resting place. Thou in the ark of thy strength. Let thy priest be clothed in righteousness and let thy godly ones sing for joy. For the sake of David, thy servant, do not turn away the face of thine anointed. This is in Psalm 132. And I believe Psalm 132 was about David, but it was written by Solomon. And this is the same, these are the same words that we've just read from Psalm 132. Let thy priests be clothed in righteousness, let the godly ones sing for joy. Arise, O Lord, to thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy strength. These are taken from the prayer that Solomon prayed on that day. They're the same words from 2 Chronicles 6. The words of Solomon as he prayed, Lord, let your eyes be ever on this house and hear the prayers of your people that are prayed here. And when you hear, forgive. And God promised that he would do just like that. Just that. The Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. 
This is my resting place forever, the Lord said. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. But Solomon said as he prayed in verse 18, 2 Chronicles 6, 18. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less, Solomon said, this temple that I have built. Solomon understood. God, this temple, as magnificent as it is, is still not even worthy of your presence. God was pleased with all that Solomon had done to build a magnificent temple as a resting place for him. But most of all, God was pleased with Solomon's heart. This was God's true resting place. Before the temple was built, at another time in Solomon's life earlier, Solomon had offered a tremendous amount of sacrifices, pointing the people to, to the God of Israel as a young king just getting started. And God appeared to him and said, ask me what you wish. What is it, Solomon, that you wish me to give you? Imagine that. The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, I believe it was. But God said to him, ask me what you would like me to give you. The God of the universe, infinite power, infinite resource, nothing impossible. It was a blank check. Imagine that. God says to Solomon, ask what you wish me to give you. And you know this story, I'm sure. Solomon said, well, I'm young. I, I need you to give me an understanding heart. to judge between good and evil. Why? So that I can lead your people. This conversation is so crucial to understanding Solomon's heart. Why did God give him this great honor? Ask me what you wish me to give you. It's because God had Solomon's heart. And Solomon's will and God's will were one. And he knew that Solomon could be trusted and that whatever he asked for, it would be for the right reasons. God was pleased. He told Solomon he had given him a wise and discerning heart. We see that in the very next chapter in 1 Kings. And he said, there will be none like you before or after. God also gave to Solomon what he did not ask for, riches and honor and the promise that there would be no one like him, no king like him all his days. You know, when I think about this story and what Psalm 132 is teaching us, that when God has our heart, the things that Jesus said begin to make more sense. When we look at Solomon, and we see that the Lord said, ask what you want me to give you, and that seemed to be boundless. There was no stipulations there. It was because God knew he had Solomon's heart. And when our hearts are his resting place, when he abides there, when we are intimate with him, he knows he can trust us with anything. And Jesus said, in John 14, 4, or 14, 14, something similar. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. We look at that and say, wow, that's incredible. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If our heart desires his character, his will, his priorities, if I am seeking intimacy with Jesus, seeking him heart, soul, mind, and strength with all my heart, then we are in the same place Solomon was. 
pure heart, entirely surrendered, empty of all self, concerned only for God and knowing Him and understanding Him and proclaiming Him. It's in that context that Jesus gives us this promise. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But when our motives are wrong, we find this verse in James. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So we see there's a dichotomy there and it all depends on the condition of the heart. And so Solomon helps us to see what God is looking for in the hearts of men. As we go to... Um, I have a slide here. I, I don't know if everything's working quite right, but if not, that's okay. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. They read this way. Ah, oh, there we go. Heaven is my throne. This is God speaking. And earth is my footstool. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. Where is the house you could possibly build for me? And what resting place is there for me? For my hand has made all these things. Therefore, all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this person I will look to him who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2, give us a picture of what God is looking for. The Apostle Paul said that Jesus desires to dwell in our hearts. And I think it's accurate to say that the Lord is really not concerned about temples. He doesn't desire to dwell in temples or even church buildings. This is not what he's interested in. The resting place that God is looking for is the hearts of men and women. People that have emptied themselves of self-will, self-desire, self-gratification. And said, Lord, let my heart be your heart. Because Jesus desires to dwell in the hearts of men. The Bible tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I believe our hearts are the throne where God desires to sit as a resting place. To commune, to be one with us, heart, soul, mind, strength. But preparing our hearts to be a resting place for the Lord is not about earning salvation. It's not about earning favor with God. It's not about trying to accomplish something by our works. That's, that's really not what it's about. What, what we're talking about here, preparing our hearts as a resting place for the Lord is about intimacy with God. Now we belong to God when we, we come to Jesus, but intimacy, intimacy with God is something more. It requires us to open our hearts to him fully and completely and to surrender to him that way, completely, without reservation. Our time is spent pursuing him. We deeply desire to know him. We want his priorities to be our priorities. His will, our will. His thoughts are our thoughts. His mind, our mind. This is what seeking intimacy with Jesus looks like. We anticipate time alone with him because we know him and we can feel his presence when we're together. The problem that we have in the area of intimacy is that we, we often approach God too casually. So I want to say that again. I want you to understand. I'm not trying to condemn anything or any, any practice or any person, but we all do this, and myself included. We, we, we tend to approach God too casually. 
And that causes intimacy with him to suffer. And what do, what do I mean by that? It hinders intimacy because our actions make it clear that he is not really that important to us. Now, let me qualify that. We don't do the things we do pursuing intimacy with God to get saved. That's not a question. We do them after we have sa- are, are saved. We know in our heart that we're going to heaven when this life ends. We know the Lord to a degree. We can sense his spirit leading us and speaking to us from the word. But intimacy, this is something more. We invite Jesus into our lives the way we would invite someone very special into our homes. How do we reach intimacy with God? We invite Jesus in the way we'd invite a special guest, an honored guest, into our very homes. We clean everything carefully. We make elaborate preparations, prepare special meals. We even let our guests have the master bedroom as a resting place during their stay. This is the right way. But how would you feel if you were a guest and you were invited into a host home. You were family. You knew each other well. And you arrive and you're tired. You've had a long trip. You're looking forward to spending time with um, your friend and family member. But as you're coming in the door, you exchange hugs and he says, well, come on in. I think there's some leftovers in the fridge. Make yourself at home. I have to get to a tennis match. I'll see you in a couple hours. You would know you're loved, certainly trusted. He's allowing you to stay in his home. You're still family, but you can tell by his behavior, I'm not really a very high priority. Sink is full of dishes. The leftovers are kind of old. The bed's not made, and the bathroom is just nasty. You see what I'm saying? By our actions, that guest would understand fully that, well, I'm not really a very high priority to to my host this trip. But folks, that's how we come to God sometimes. And when we talk about preparing our hearts, we're talking about doing those things. We get the sin out, even the little things. Because in my heart and in your life, you've probably experienced this too, where Maybe I'm watching a movie, and it's not necessarily a sinful movie, but there's things going on in the movie that God doesn't approve of, and it's like, ah, it's a good guy, bad guy thing. Yeah, yeah, I love it, and the, the good guy wins in the end, and I, I, I'm done with that. And it's not really sinful or anything, but I feel kind of hollow inside. I certainly don't feel closer to the Lord because sometimes God waits in the other room while I'm finishing that movie. You know what I mean? The intimacy, the intimacy. It causes intimacy to suffer. Now, this doesn't mean we get close to God by good works or the things we do. That's not really the question today. The question is preparing our hearts, preparing our souls, so that he can abide right here without ever feeling grieved by the words of our mouth, the actions that I take, the things that I do, the habits that I have. I put all of those things in good order so that my heart can become a resting place for him. And he can abide there all the time. And he never has to get up and excuse himself because some of the things that are being said in my conversations cause him grief. And so when we talk about preparing our hearts, this is what I'm trying to communicate. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And as the Spirit of God dwells within us, our hearts are to become His home and His resting place. Prepared in such a way as we would prepare for a very special guest that's coming to visit. And not someone we're acquainted with, 
family, definitely. We love each other. But I don't want that person to feel like they're not a very high priority when they come to spend time with me. Amen? So like Solomon, in his days as a young king, we want to humbly prepare our hearts for intimacy with God. Amen. I'd like to invite the worship team to come back up and close our service today. And then after they sing a final song, I'll come back up and close the service. So Pastor Ralph had a very specific song that he wanted us to end on, which really just flows right out of uh, where he ended. And it was new to me, so it might be new to you. But I just want to encourage us in this time, instead of standing, let's just begin to remain sitting. Use this as a of prayer. Part of this song comes right out of that passage of Isaiah 66, 1, singing the words of the Lord, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Talk about his desire, for where is his resting place? And then the chorus is really a response saying, Lord, I've prepared for you a home. I desire you to dwell here within me. As Pastor Ralph noted in the New Testament, we are called the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so feel free to sing this as you're sitting. Feel free to use this as a time of, of prayer and reflection. And when we get through, then Pastor Ralph will come up and close our time.
Let's stand together as we close in prayer this morning. Father, as we stand before you today, we ask, Lord, help us to know our own hearts. Help us to know when we are being honest with you and honest with ourselves. Help us to know how to find intimacy with you. Not just a casual acquaintance, but deep intimacy. We're like John, when he leaned on the breast of Jesus, he could hear your heartbeat. Lord, help us to be able to hear your heartbeat. That when we pray, we know you're listening. We can sense your presence. We know you're pleased with us. Not because our works are good, but because you own our hearts. And all that we have is yours. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. And as we close, I would just like to pray for our people here. And excuse me while I follow Solomon's example and take his posture. Oh, Father, I pray for your people here today that you would fill their hearts and that they would know you intimately. Lord, that we would feel your closeness, your spirit's touch, that we would know in our hearts when we are walking close and when we are kind of drifting a little bit. Lord, I mean not to condemn or to shame or to cast doubt on anyone's faith here today. I Lord, I Lord, I pray that every soul here would be secure in their faith, knowing that they are loved, knowing that they are family but Lord, intimacy is something more. And this is what we seek. Heart, soul, mind, and strength commitment. Seeking you with all of our heart. Lord, begin with me and may it spread to our people and to our community and the surrounding areas. And we ask this in Jesus' name. May all we do be done to your glory for our good and for the furthering of your kingdom. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you, folks. Didn't mean to get theatrical there, sorry. But God bless you and give you a wonderful day, and uh, we'll see you again soon.